Hi, friends. Thank you for joining me this day, uh, wherever, however, and which way ever you listen to this. Uh, may it go well with you as we are back at it uh, today uh, with uh, Genesis 30, 1 to 26, uh, entitled Mandrakes. Uh, Mandrakes, I think, uh, indicates kind of the tension of the text, the human endeavor uh, versus the will of God. And this is uh, the tension I think uh, ever since God remembering Noah, now we see God remembering uh, Rachel. Uh, We see God opening wombs. We see God, uh, his will being done, um, all in the midst of it, the human uh, will and, well, how messy it can be. So definitely uh, a lot to be learned here today. Uh, Thank you for joining me again. This is Pastor Ernie Jung here at Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. Uh, What a wonderful day it is as we are gathered again to hear God's word. Uh, Why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, We thank you for this time together. Lord, you you by your grace remember us uh, through the giving of your Son, that though we... We are dead in our sin. Lord, you, you make us alive and grant us the newness of life through the sacrifice upon the cross in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, bless us this day as we are sustained by your word, as your word continues to dwell within us. Lord, lead us always um, in your promises. Lord, for all these things we are thankful, we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so today... Uh, Genesis 30, 1 to 26. Genesis 30, verses 1 to 20, 26. If you can get your Bible out here with me. And I hope, um, I hope you all are doing well um, whenever you're listening to this. And um, I pray that uh, this word will go well with you. All right. Why don't we begin here? Genesis 30. Verses 1 to 26. Uh, Why don't we begin with verse 1. Ready? Ready? Yes. Very good. Let's start. Chapter 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Right? Again, when we look at this picture, you guys, of where Rachel is at in all this, Uh, give me children lest I will die, right? She was fueled by her envy. Now, envy does a lot to people, doesn't it? Envy and jealousy. Wow, what a monster it is and how it manifests itself in our sinful nature. Like we, you know, you know what I mean in the examples of envy, maybe in your own life too. You know, you go down that uh, that tunnel visioned kind of pursuit of what I want and I will get it however I can, however I can and whatever measure it needs to take, I want it. And we see Rachel doing what? Leah has already had four children. We, we talked about Reuben, Simeon, Levi. Uh, we, we, we ended with Judah last week. I mean, this is what a great, uh, as the tribes of Israel being, are being formed, of course, the will of God is uh, continuing here. Uh, but here, uh, surrounded by, uh, by children, Rachel, you know, remembering the promise and, and uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Jacob uh, at Bethel, you know, with the ladder and, and the ascending and descending and, and God uh, giving them the word saying, um, behold, verse uh, twenty, uh, verse thirteen of chapter twenty-eight. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, "I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Israel. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, and your offspring shall be all the families of the earth. They will be blessed." Right. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. So again, 
uh, kind of a reiteration of, of what was given to Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. And Rachel here, barren she was, and she was envious, and, and she was demanding in her envy what? Give me children. Lest I will, or else I will die. It's as if, <laughs> you know, in this envious state, she, her expectation of Jacob was, give this to me, as if Jacob was, as we see in verse 2, as he shows the true colors of, well, he knows who he is, verse 2. It says, Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? I mean, only if it worked this way, but it does not. Right? Well, we see earlier with Leah, right, in verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, right, right there in verse 31, he opened her womb. You know, Leah's womb was opened by the power and, and the creation, or uh, by God who creates and who gives life uh, uh, through the womb of Leah, right? It's not Jacob. And we very well know Jacob is fertile, because here we see that he is having all these babies with Leah, but now Rachel's barren and she's on this envious, and again, we, we can totally empathize with Rachel because, you know, when you're in that moment of envy, you know what I mean. Right? All you care about is, is getting what you want, getting what will fulfill or will get rid of that envy. And, and, and in, in her case, it was a baby. Right? Give me a child lest I will die. Right? I mean, how... Well, this puts Jacob uh, between a rock and a hard place. Like, what, what can he do? Right? Am I in the place of God? I mean, his anger. He was kindled. He was upset. Like, what are you saying? Right? I mean, what are you saying, Rachel? Who has the power to create? And Jacob clearly shows us that it is... Am I in the place of God? No, God is the one who creates. So, in light of this, and Rachel putting two, two and two together, like what, what, what is there to do? Right? We see it right here in verse 3. And this is just kind of history repeating itself, isn't it? Then she said, Here is my servant Bila. Go into her, so that she may give birth on my behalf that even I may have children through her. So, so okay, my, my womb is barren, so now we're going to use my servant, Bilah, right? And through her, I'm going to have a child. Again, th this is, you know, and this is the tension, right? God said you will be blessed, offspring, north, south, east, west. Rachel's barren. What is she to do? I need children. Right? What, what, what measure can we take? Surely my womb cannot bear children, and I need to find my servant to have children for me. So she tells Jacob, go, you know, have children with Bila and uh, on my behalf, and I will have children through her. Right? Um, and we see in the King James text uh, that uh, he uses the term, uh, in that text, to bear upon the knee. And, and, and this is the picture of, uh, uh, of a blessing of birth that is uh, from the word knees, barak, which is very close to barak, which means blessing, right? So there we would see a blessing in this kind of maneuver, right? In this having a child with uh, her servant. And uh, this was the hope, to have the great blessing. And, and, and again, you know, we see the tension of, 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 uh, of Rachel, right? And I totally can empathize with her on what she's facing at this time. So, verses 4 to 6. So she gave him her servant Bilah as a wife, and Jacob went into her, and Bilah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Right? So there is a son, just as he planned. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Now, why is that interesting? Well, you know, Dan means God is my judge. But what does, what does Rachel say? Okay, so she has a servant. 
she is, uh, she is, she becomes pregnant. She has this baby, and therefore Rachel says, "I will call him Dan." Why? Well, God has judged me. God has vindicated me. God has brought me justice, right? And also that He has heard my my voice. So, so we see not only uh, her envy, but also we see her acknowledgement that God, God is there. God is leading. God is guiding. And this is, I think, the tension, my friends, as we live our life of faith, as we live, uh, you know, at the end of the church here, we are, as we spoke of the foolish and the wise on Sunday, as we live in the now and wait for the not yet. We endure in Christ. We endure in his word. And we, we see the kind of the, the tension here. On one hand, she is envious. On one hand, she's pulling out all the stops. On one hand, she's trying to maneuver her way to get a child. But on the other hand, she names God is my judge. God is, brings justice. God vindicates. God hears my voice. So, so there we see clearly that uh, uh, all, all acknowledgement, uh, all credit is going uh, to our Lord. Right? And uh, this is what we see here uh, with Rachel. All right, verse 7 and 8, if you could read that with me. Rachel's servant Bella conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Right? Um, and this Naphtali, Naphtali, uh, it's from the word twists. Right, um, that her wrestling, as we see, uh, a sign of what was to come with Jacob wrestling with God, but her true wrestle, Niftala means my struggle. Her true struggle wasn't really at the end of the day, wasn't, wasn't uh, this competition with Leah. No. Right? Her 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 struggle, her trial was in the midst of my barren womb. What are we to do in the midst of God's promises of the offspring, blessing, nation upon nation to the ends, north, south, east, west? My struggle is ultimately uh, with who? With God. And 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 this is this is a very applicable thing for all of us because I think at times when we face the struggles, the trials, the tribulations, all these things, right? Uh, the, 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 the 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 tentatio, even the spiritual attacks. You know, there are times where we say, "Where is God?" Right? When when we say in Romans eight, who you know, if God is for us, who can be against us? Yet when in, in times of that deep struggle. How we face that tension of, yes, I have faith, but Lord, help me in my unbelief. And if Talai, as she names uh, this child, this son, again, sons abound uh, so far in our text, right? Uh, the, the male child abounding here. We see the struggle. Ultimately, that struggle wasn't against Leah. But the struggle was the, the trust in the will of God, the, 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 the timetable, the, the way to which God would uh, lead Rachel at the end of the day. All right. Zilpah and Asher, who are these people? Verse 9 to 13, and again, these, these are the tribes coming up here. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took a servant Zilpah and gave her uh, to Jacob as his wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son, and Leah said... Again, Leah had a servant, Zilpah, right? Good fortune has come. So he called his name Gad. Leah's servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I for women who have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. So after she uh, seemingly ceased to bear children, she gave uh, uh, the, uh, the uh Servant Zilpa, and there we have the name. Sorry, not Zilpa again. Gad and Asher. Right? The fortune, my fortune, versus happy or blessed. You know, there is much to be said about names. Names that indicate a lot about the parents who are naming them, right? 
And it really does, I don't know if you ever asked your parents, like, why did you name me so-and-so? And, and they give you a story, right? And so it is here. You know, it, it does tell a story to what is going on in the moment of Leah and Re Rachel and how they're having children. Right? And for sure, Leah, we, we see oh, how fortunate, with luck, right? And this is kind of where she's at. How happy and blessed. We'll name him Asher. All the meanwhile, we see the predicament of Rachel still barren. What is she to do? Read 14 to 18. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Uh, Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, Sorry about that. Um, I lost my place. Oh, you must come into me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar, right? So clearly, uh, what is happening here? Um, mandrakes. These were known as an aphrodisiac, some type of mysterious uh, fertility plant. And uh, with Rachel, we very well know she was barren. So that means what? Jacob was having children left and right with everyone but her, right? the servants, her servant, Leah's servant, and Leah herself. And fertility was what she coveted. And there in this great trade, uh, she gave the mandrakes and Leah would have Jacob. This is the pursuit, my friends, uh, of trying to fulfill what they wanted. Right? And that is by this humanism that we speak of. This is the tension of the text, to manipulate, to maneuver, uh, to do what is best by their own accord. And, and we see mandrakes are the big thing, right? And, and again, this mandrake uh, really does illumine our view of Rachel and what she's going through, that she's pulling out all the stops to have children. And um, even to the point where it's really centered on humanism on her own human will, on her own motive, on her own way. And this is, again, this is the tension. We, we can empathize with Rachel because we very well know there is God's word. There is his promises. There is his will that is done. We prayed in the Lord's Prayer time and time again. Yet at the same time, there is our fallen human nature that says what? My time, my way, my timetable, my will, my human pursuit, my human endeavor. And, and we see this tension here. Mandrakes, right? Um, and this was the hope. I need children, Rachel would say. And I will go at all costs to have children. And, and this was all kind of in our, we, we go back to this verse one, that envious state, you know, just fueled by this pursuit and doing anything at all costs to become pregnant. But what was the result? Well, Leah, became pregnant, right? She had more children. And, and here we see uh, the names of, as we see right here, Issachar, right? Issachar from the Hebrew sakar, which means wage or reward, right? And, and, and here we see, uh, uh, you know, as it says right there, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. And it wasn't over. Verse 19 to 21, And Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name um, 
Dinah. And, and here we see Zebulun, right, clearly. Uh, Zebulun means to dwell. Right? So that was all in the hopes of, of maybe I've had six children for Jacob. Maybe he'll, you know, we, we know the, 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 the dynamic of their relationship. Uh, Rachel was the one who was loved and favored, uh, as we see in verse 31 um, in the last chapter. It was L Leah who was unloved or hated, right? So maybe this was enough. And now she could dwell. And she also had Dina. No etymology is given there about her name. Again, just magnifying the importance of the male in this family line. And we, we've had six males so far. Then we had uh, the, the, the little girl, Dinah, here. And we see uh, how Leah continues to bear children. Right? Earlier it said she would cease to bear children, but now she continued to bear more children. All um, in, in light of the tribes. All right. So this is the crux right here, verse 22 to 24, to which I want to kind of really hone in on uh, for the rest of our Bible study together, which we have like, I think, uh, 15, 13 more minutes. Let's see. Verse 22 to 24. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. Indeed, Joseph. Right. It wasn't the mandrakes. No credit to the mandrakes. What does it say right there? God remembered Rachel. Does God forget his word? Does God forget his promises? You know, the Lord's will is done. Because God does not lie. And there, when we talk about God remembering, this is of great comfort. We see earlier in Genesis, I believe, yes, Genesis chapter 8, we see God remembering who? Noah. Now we see Rachel. What does it mean to remember? What does it mean that God remembers? Right? It means that God remembers them. He remembers the promise. He remembers what he was... Uh, what he uh, promised to do, that this remembering is indicating that God is faithful. God delivers. God promises. That God follows through. God remembers Rachel. God listens. God Open the womb. Luther says this. Have your ears, ears peeled for this one. It's kind of a long paragraph. Therefore, it had to grow and become strong. And for this reason, God put matters off until the second, third, fourth, and fifth year. Then for the first time, he gave consolation through your maidservant. But your sobbing did not find rest. God still seemed to be turned away. Therefore, God remembered although he had never forgotten you for one moment. But this was finally the time for him to hear your sighs when you thought that they had been completely buried, covered, and forgotten. This is how we too would learn to ask and hope for help whenever there is misfortune and faith totters. For we have the promise of the gospel. We have baptism, absolution, etc., by which we have been instructed and strengthened. We have the command which we are ordered to pray. We have the spirit of grace and of prayer. But as soon as we have begun to pray, our heart is troubled and complains that it is accomplishing nothing. Therefore, one must learn that if you accomplish nothing by asking, you should seek. If that too seems to be useless and God conceals and hides himself even more, add knocking and do not cease. For there is no doubt that our prayer is heard immediately after the first syllable has been uttered. And, and this is the crux of our, of our text today, right? God remembers, he does not forget. Luther says this again. He says, uh, um, But as soon as we have begun to pray, our heart is troubled and complains that it is accomplishing nothing. He goes on to say that God hears our first syllable. You know, God remembers us. He, he doesn't forget. And that remembrance is his word. God remembers his word for what he gives Rachel. 
And there he would open her womb and give her Joseph. God remembers you, the gospel, baptism, the Lord's Supper. God gives you his word and imparts to you and declares you forgiven. This is, this is the picture of as we toil, as we struggle, as we suffer, as we act as if God has forgotten us or has turned his back on us or just does not hear our prayers anymore, God is reminding us, no, I hear your prayers. I hear the first breath, the first syllable. I hear them. As, after all, the Bible says what? Pray without, un, uh, without ceasing, right? Rejoice always and pray without seeking, uh, ceasing. We see uh, Luther talking about Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask, seek, and knock. Because God remembers. And what a privilege it is to pray, my friends. Because prayer is a gift. Jesus is your intercessor. And therefore, as Jesus, the Christ, the one who died and rose for you, who is your intercessor, you better believe it, that he hears our prayers. That even in the times of this great trial from envy, right, to the servant, to mandrakes, to pulling out all costs, at the end of the day, God very well knew. Rachel wasn't forgotten. You are not forgotten. God listens. He opens a womb. God listens to us. And there he delivers to us uh, his very promises. You know, it, it says right there, God has taken away my reproach. Right? That disappointment, that discouragement. Right? God has lifted that burden, lifted that reproach. Why don't we read Luke chapter 1, verse 7, real quick. And we're almost done here. Luke chapter 1, verse 7. And here we see a similar thing with Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? Luke 1, 7. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. All right. So same situation. Uh, verse 25, same chapter. Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Right? Similar words from Rachel. Verse 36 to 38. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Again, we, we, we look at Luke 1, we look at St. John the Baptist, the birth, Zechariah, Elizabeth, even Mary there with the virgin birth, uh, the incarnation of Christ, of course. Uh, what, a, what a great picture of how God remembers that he does take away that reproach, right? that he gives life, that he provides for Zechariah and Elizabeth and, and radically in this gospel uh, for the virgin womb there with Mary. And, and this is the picture, my friends, of Rachel. The burden has been lifted, the disappointment. How was that lifted? By, by her human endeavor? No, by the will and the word of God. The promise. That's how the reproach was lifted. By God remembering her, by God listening to her, by God opening up her womb. Article 1, Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Article 2, the gospel, Jesus. The line to which this would lead ultimately uh, through the line of Judah. Twelve tribes here. God said in Luke or in Genesis 28, right? Again, from the north, south, east, west, I, you will bear much offspring. And here we see it. His word is done. And that's the thing, my friends. In the midst of trial, when you're facing great suffering and you do not understand why, your human nature says what? I need to figure this out myself because, well, I'm living as if I'm forgotten by God. When in fact, when we flee to his word, when we rest upon his word, they say, no, God does not forget me. God is with me. His scripture says it. And when I pray, he hears my prayers and he will answer it in his will and time. That's the tension, my friends, right, uh, 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 of our life and faith. And, and here we see it with, 
with Rachel. At the end of the day, through all the hoops and through all the weaving and, and through all the making my way in hopes of having children, there God remembers Rachel and gives her a child. Joseph, the Lord adds, right? God will add Joseph. That's what it means. God will add. God will add. That's why the word is so important. Because the word gets us back to who our Lord is and what he has done for us. Then in the midst of all that we're facing, there we rest upon his word and say, aha, that's right. God is with me. He will never leave nor forsake me. He is with me till the end of the age. He has given me Jesus. He forgives me of my sin. He, he gives me everlasting life through his death and resurrection. Uh, I'm robed in his righteousness. I, I, I feed on his body and blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And, and there he remembers me. He remembers and gives me his word. Where there I have the greatest comfort. And this is Rachel. All right. Verse 25 and 26 we conclude here. Now the time has come. Many years have passed. And uh, we see Jacob saying, I, I think it's time to go. So he says in verse 25 and 26, As soon as Rachel had born, Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go for you, that I may go, for you know the service that I've given you. Now again, that I've served you, that you know the service that I've given you. Right? We, we see that repetition from Jacob saying, I've done it all. I, I can't be held here any longer. I, I got to go. Right? Even in the midst of all the trickery, even in the midst of all the switching, I got to go. And, and he served uh, faithfully there. And next time we'll see how this departure will be. But until then, friends, hopefully this helps you here uh, in terms of how we can apply this to our own lives through all the temptations, through all the spiritual attacks. The word never changes. The word endures. And there we flee. This is so paramount as we live in the life of faith. We're not living double lives, my friends. We're not living double lives. We're not compartmentalizing our faith. We're not just saying, I live this way and I live another way and, well, I'll just select which one I want to live each day. No, we live in Christ. We live in His Word. There are sufferings. There are spiritual attacks from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Yet as we look at Rachel, it's a reminder that's right. The Word. The Word endures. The Word is Christ. And the word fulfills. Not mandrakes, not my envy, not my covetousness, no. God remembering Rachel. Let us pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. Lord, bless us in your word that through all things, Lord, your word delivers, that your word is faithful, and that you have given us this promise in Christ. Bless us, the Lord, this day and grant us uh, sustaining in your word and lead us in the wisdom of your word as you as you lead us by your eternal light. Lord, for all of these things we're thankful. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, thank you for joining me today, and uh, may this word go well with you. Until next time, this is Pastor Ernie Jung here at Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California, 93021. Until next time, adios and goodbye. <laughs>